have a look at this Hungarian political cartoon made after the Hungarian uprising of 1956. I've translated the caption at the bottom saying this is a purely Hungarian matter. There's a few more bits there which you might want to be looking around the image, so pause the video and have a think about what the message of this cartoon is. So hopefully you've managed to pick up on a few things. Obviously we've got a couple of intimidating military types guarding this ruined doorway into an area here. We've got the international community on the left hand side. Hopefully you can see this is supposed to be America here, kind of looking like Uncle Sam. You've got Britain here with his Union Jack, vaguely looking Churchillian. You've got this young, pathetic looking angel here. It says you know there, but that's the UN. See this angelic figure with a photo and nothing else particularly scary or intimidating against these two intimidating folk. Right at the bottom, you've got what you might recognise as the Hungarian flag. That word there is Hungarian for Hungary with a dead body on top of it. So clearly the message of this cartoon is that the international community, including Britain, America and the UN, are completely helpless or at least completely unwilling to help. The Hungarians during the Hungarian uprising. And as we go through this, you see that this is very accurate in terms of what Britain, America and the UN actually did. This lesson we're going to be looking at the consequences of the Hungarian uprising 1956. Now on Schoology there are photocopies of the textbook for this. You don't need it unless you really want every single bit of precise factual detail. This PowerPoint should be enough for almost all of you. The more eagle-eyed among you will see the third success criteria saying I can understand how to score full marks in a question one. Again, don't worry, we don't expect you to do a question for this one. You should already have done a question one on the Truman Doctrine. But we'll look at why students get different marks for this question in particular. If you want to complete it and send it in, we'll happily mark it. If I'm your teacher, you'll probably get it back in six to eight weeks' time. The consequences of the Hungarian uprising can be sorted into three different categories. The impact or the consequences of Hungary, the impact on Eastern Europe and the impact on the Cold War as a whole. Last lesson we looked at the human cost for Hungarians. 20,000 died in the fighting and the reprisals afterwards and 200,000 fled the country, most of whom never returned. Naji himself was removed from power and later hanged and he was replaced by Qadar. So because Qadar was one of those puppet leaders, they would do whatever the USSR told them. Hungary will never again try to leave the Warsaw Pact until the very last years of the Cold War, when all of Eastern Europe and communism is crumbling. In terms of the result on Eastern Europe, Khrushchev had shown that he was still capable of being as ruthless as Stalin. No country dared to rise up against Stalin because they knew what Stalin would do to them. Under a new leader like Khrushchev, some people in Hungary or Poland or other places had dared to dream of rising up. Khrushchev had shown what the consequences would be. As a result, no Eastern European country would strongly challenge communism or the USSR until 1968. And even then, that's under a different leader, Brezhnev, rather than Khrushchev. In terms of the consequences for superpower relations or the wider implications for the Cold War, this is obviously going to worsen relations. America saw that democracy, or at least Naji's small attempt at democracy, had been ruthlessly crushed. The president at the time is Eisenhower, who we'll learn a bit about in a future lesson. He saw Khrushchev's de Stalinization speech as a lie. Now, in fairness to Khrushchev, you can hold both of those things. You can hold de Stalinization and a willingness to ruthlessly crush any democracy. The problem was the West had taken the secret speech to be Khrushchev opening up the East. And that's not what he was saying at all. He was saying that Stalin went too far, not that I'm happy for democracy. This is a weird thing in the Cold War course where I'll often end up defending these awful communist dictators. But a lot of the times the West are taking things as they shouldn't. On the other hand, Khrushchev thought that the Hungarian uprising was actually a really good success for him. This had reinforced that idea of a sphere of influence that Stalin had carried out from the Potsdam. Behind the Iron Curtain, the West was not interfering. The most that Eisenhower did was give speeches like there where he says the heart of America goes out to the people of Hungary. Thoughts and prayers and no real action. 
Now, there's a minor point as to why Britain, France or America didn't get strongly involved in Hungary, which goes into a diplomatic crisis of Britain and France's making. Here we've got a map of Europe and Africa and Asia, and we've got a map of the Suez Canal in particular. Now, the Suez Canal was an amazing innovation. It took millions and millions of pounds to create, but it meant that shipping from Europe to Asia did not have to go all the way around Africa. It had been largely built with European money, but now that Egypt was an independent country, its leader, a man called Nasser, nationalised it. In other words, he took control of it from the private investors who controlled it, and he said, we were not going to reimburse you. In other words, we're not going to pay you for taking this from you. Now, Britain, France and Israel decided to invade Egypt to take the Suez Canal back. It started out fairly well, but very soon Egypt and its allies were able to force back this joint army of Britain, France and mainly Israel. Now, the problem for America is that this was happening at literally the same time as the Hungarian uprising was being crushed. So it would be highly hypocritical for President Eisenhower to strongly condemn what's happening in Hungary without also strongly condemning his own allies, Britain, France and Israel. So all of this distracted world opinion and it muted the US response. So again, this reinforced Khrushchev's idea that behind the Iron Curtain, the Soviet Union can do what it likes and America will not interfere. Now, if you have a look at this map, which we looked at last lesson, one reason why Hungarians were largely on their own is that the geography was not in their favour. If this had been happening in Czechoslovakia next to West Germany, there's a greater chance that America might have interfered, not that they interfered in the Czechoslovakian uprising in 1968. But Hungary is landlocked. In other words, there's no port where you can just drop off troops. That means you have to go through at least one other country to get there. You can go through the communist Czechoslovakia. You can go through the communist Soviet Union or Romania. You can go from the non-Soviet Union aligned Yugoslavia, which is still communist. Or you can just go through that Austria democratic country, which had promised to be neutral the year before. None of those are good options. So even if the West or America had wanted to intervene with military help, it'd be very unfortunate, very unlikely that they'd be able to do that. In any case, we've got a quote from the documentary from last lesson. We needed either a military intervention or a miracle from heaven. If the angel Gabriel came down with a flaming sword, that would be military intervention. If the United Nations arrived with tanks, that would be the miracle. So you see the kind of like black dark humour of Hungarians at this time. The idea is they'd lost all idea of the UN or the West helping them. Some real military help would be if God sent down angels to crush the Soviets. So pause the video and have a think about why the USA and the UN failed to intervene. But the geographical point I just explained, but think about the wider diplomatic or military decisions that they have to think about. And also think about, is their decision to not intervene the least worst choice? There's a stretch and trend I'd like you to think about as well. Might the West have intervened more strongly if the uprising had happened in East Germany? So again, thinking about the geography and the diplomacy or the politics of the situation, is it the case that the West or America in particular was simply less concerned with Hungary than with Berlin? So for Question two and the stretch and challenge. There's no clear right answer to this, but it is definitely worth thinking about for an important question, just your understanding of the Cold War. Why is it that countries like Hungary or Czechoslovakia tended to be left alone, but places like Germany were much more strongly intervened with? Now we're going to have a look at another consequence question. Like I said, there's no expectation that you guys do this unless you particularly want to. I'm just going to look at what the mark scheme is like for this question. We'll look at a couple of model answers. And if you want to do one more attempt on it, feel free. So question one says, explain two consequences of dot, dot, dot. It will always start that way. And in the exam paper, you'll actually get consequence one and a few lines, consequence two and a few lines. It's eight marks that each of those two consequences is marked separately. So you can't get more than four for one consequence, even if you wrote 20 pages. 
obviously you're going to start with the wording of the question. One consequence of the hungry uprising was blah, blah, blah. And you've got those sorts of key phrases which you should be using in any of these Cold War questions and many of the other GCSE questions. This was important because, as a result, this meant that, because of this, anything like that. If you're not using those sorts of words, it's probable that you're not actually explaining, you're only describing. Now, I've got two different examples here, and you can see the mark seems a little bit whiffly here. You can't just say this is definitely a two mark answer because it'll come down to how strict or how generous the examiner is being. But it's definitely the case that the lower question, or sorry, the lower answer is better than the higher one. So I'm not going to read out both of these, just going to point out what my colour color coding is here. The red is the key phrases, so attempt at explanation, and anything that's underlined is precise factual detail. So you can see you don't actually have to do that much more to get at least one, if not two, extra marks. You're explaining it much more clearly, and you're throwing in as much factual detail as you can remember. So rather than saying that Khrushchev wanted to be different from Stalin, you've got Khrushchev's de-Stalinization speech, 1956. So basically the same amount of words, but definitely worth at least an extra mark to the precise factual detail from the period. Going on to an outstanding answer here, this is definitely four marks out of four. You can see you've got more precise factual detail underlined there. You've got some more key phrases and explanations. The bit in blue at the bottom is colour coded because you guys haven't actually studied it yet. But going back to a question like this, you'd be able just to throw in half a sentence talking about the building of the Berlin Wall in 1961. So if you wanted to do another question or another part of this question and email it to your teacher, see what they think, you could do a consequence of, or sorry, a consequence for Hungary itself or a consequence for Eastern European countries, or you could just put them in together and just talk about Eastern Europe as a whole. So that's all we've got on the Hungarian uprising 1956. This is also the final part of topic one. So topic one starts in 1940s during World War II and it ends in 1956 or I guess up to 1960. Topic two will be on three Cold War crises, the building of the Berlin Wall, the Cuban Missiles Crisis and the invasion of Czechoslovakia, otherwise known as the Prague Spring and the uprising.